Hi, this is Alex with another not a picking video. So I've been working on a whole bunch of these American locks because they're really good um, for training and they're just fun locks. And I'm left-handed. Um, and so, you know, woohoo, he's left-handed. Who cares? Um, let me just give you an example of why this might be interesting. Uh, this is not a proper Peterson pry bar, but you end up... Um, you can't use your index finger. You end up with your, your thumb on there kind of doing this and you're essentially pressing up. The, the, tor the, the vector is kind of up and I mean even with the, the better one which I can't find at the moment, um, it tends to fly out when I'm picking and I don't like that because then I lose my set and I have to start again and I curse and all sorts of things. So I've got a new ten tensor that I've used a couple of times and it seems to work pretty well. I'm not going to pick this on video right now. It's this particular lock I have not picked open. Um, it's kind of grungy and I don't know, it's hard. But let me just show you what I did. So, zooming back in. And I'm going to try to get in real tight on this if I can. So, this is a piece of, I think, eighth inch music wire, okay, that I did a little bit of forging on and a whole bunch of filing. And I cust I was sort of inspired by uh, Kokomo's video on, on making music wire tensors. But one novel thing I did, or I don't know if it's novel, but it's novel for me, is that I cut, where's my pointer? And it's going to be a little hard to see, and I apologize for camera work, as always, but I cut a little shelf here on the top, as well as the sides, and then this center bit is sized perfectly for the American Keyway. And then you can see there's kind of a really wacky shape to it, and you'll see why that's interesting in a moment. So it's got a, zooming back out and getting rid of the magnet, um, got kind of a, a curve here, curve there. I bent this and this using heat. I'm heating it up to red hot and, and then um, bending it. Um, and then you can see that I reheat treated it. You can see the color on there. And I brought it to a, a blue color all the way to the end, which is just sort of a spring temper, which should be pretty tough for uh, for the type of work it's going to be doing. So for me, I stick this in, okay, and, huh, completely obstructs the keyway. Did I get that right? No. Huh. That's better. Head backwards. For me, I'll edit, have to edit that out, or not. Let's show you that I'm a goofball. But for me, that works pretty well. You can see that that is seated pretty firmly in there. And you'll also notice I'm pressing it in this direction, which is tending to push the wrench back up into the keyway rather than down or in some other direction. And now I can get in here and pick and not have to worry as much about the um, the wrench going flying in all directions when I'm you know one pin away from Nirvana. Um, maybe I will attempt to pick this, um, but not with this pick. Um, it's also very comfortable. I put a little bit of knurling. I don't know if you can see it. Um, and I'm not a master knurler, but there's the dog. Excuse the noise. Just used a little triangle file and just cut some marks uh, perpendicular here and then a couple of diagonals just to give it a little bit more grip right there. And uh, so, yeah, let's see, maybe we can pick this open. I haven't ever picked this lock open, but maybe my new tensor and the support of everyone watching will. Um, the other thing is I notice that I don't have to apply, I actually don't have to apply hardly any tension just kind of have to keep it from falling over. 
right? So in with the even with the Petersons, if I kind of really let go, um, they will often tend to. I got to listen for the clicks. They will tend to want to fall out, and so I end up having to apply a lot more tension than really I should uh, for particularly for for Americans. So this is sized for this particular American keyway. I used this one as a gauge when I was um, cutting this. So you may have to, um, you know, I may have to make a few more. Um, music wire I got at a hobby shop locally. I like to buy stuff like this from little stores if I can because they're they have trouble staying in business. But that said, you can also buy it off of Amazon or eBay or uh, any probably any metalworking supply shop. You just want to make sure that what you get is steel, um, carbon steel. Um, and the other thing I would note is that this stuff, at least the, the particular product that I got, was really, really hard when I got it. As in, it ate my hacksaw blade. Um, cutting through it. I should have probably used the Dremel, but I was in the vise and I was in a hand tool mode. Um, so when you are going to work it, I strongly recommend annealing it. And uh, you can look at my heat treating video for annealing, um, a demo of that on a smaller piece of metal. But basically you heat the thing up to the um, critical temperature, which is usually somewhere between a cherry red and kind of a little brighter red and that's the um, I believe the for that the temperature is um, right about when it goes non-magnetic so another good time to have a magnet on hand um, you then just let it cool um, for this I had it on a little ceramic plate um, that I bought it's they call it a soldering plate or something like that um, but it's a refractory ceramic material. Um, it's also nice because it helps hold some of the heat when you're heating it up so you use less gas. Um, but I just left it on there and let it sit for 15 minutes or whatever until it was what they call hand cool, which hand warm rather, which means it's not gonna burn you when you pick it up. Um, and then I, um, I worked it um, and, uh, and then hardened it um, and, uh, and, uh, tempered it. So, and then, well, you watch me fail to pick this lock. The last little remark is when you are going to harden the metal, which is where you take it up again, past the critical temperature where it loses its magnetism or where it'll no longer stick to a magnet or attract a magnet. Um, you want to make sure that the entire part that you care about, that you want to heat treat, is at that temperature. And it's a little easier with a material this thick, but with like a lock pick or something, something this thin, you heat this air and that end cools down, right? The whole thing. So I set it down on, a, um, on that ceramic plate. Um, it's why I was using the stove in the other video, because that, that has the advantage of spreading the heat out better. But um, uh, that would have, well, the wife was getting kind of grumpy about that. But, um, so I heat it on that plate, and what I do is I set the plate across a basin of water, like a little bucket, and uh, of, of cool water or brine, or if you're using oil, whatever. Um, and then, just as the whole thing is at the temperature that I want, I just basically shove it in there. I just knock it off the edge into the water, um, and uh, it'll. Uh, it's, you don't have quite as much control of trying to get it to the steam to move away, and but it uh, compared to just getting differential heating and having some of the parts not get fully hardened, it seems to work pretty well. Um, and you just leave it in there until it stops sizzling, and you pop it out and do your heat treatment. Um, and then a final tip is when you're doing the heat treatment, when you're doing the, the final tempering, um, you want to be very, very gentle, if you're, especially if you're using a, a flame, which is which I was because I needed to take this up to about, what is it, 400, 
450C to get it to this this blue color, um, which is holding up very nicely. Um, I'm sucking at picking this, but this wrench is working awesome. Um, and um, it'll go through that temperature really fast, and if it gets too far, then it softens, and you don't want that. Um, so I, I use a map torch when I'm doing the bending and the, um, the annealing and the hardening because it heats it a lot faster. When I go to do the, um, the tempering, or, um, which is softening it actually from that full glass hard state, I move to a propane torch and just very gently warm the thing. Start at an area that I <coughs> care less about. Watch the color move, right? And then just start sort of moving it around. And then you have to be careful as you reach these, screw this, as you reach the thinner parts because it's obviously there's less mass, metal mass there, and you, um, and they will, they will heat much faster. And remember, of course, that there's residual heat that will continue to move through the piece. Um, so you just want to, you know, be really gentle, move the heat up until you get the right um, color. The color will go away as it rusts and, you know, you handle it, but if you could, I don't know how well the color is coming out there, but that's sort of that cobalt blue sort of color. Um, that's a moderate spring tension. I got it to a lighter blue here, which is uh, even um, softened even a little bit more, so it's going to be springier. Um, less hard, but less likely to fracture, hopefully. And then you can see the full range of color here, if I can get the Continuing the steel you get from the factory. Um, this was a, a, a full blue temper um, carbon steel um, Kind of like you'd see in a hacksaw blade um, You can see it's that color. It's that sort of a similar color to that somewhere in here, right? Um, it still has the oxidation on it so um, That's kind of what you're shooting for if you take it too far <clears throat> It's going to be too soft at, the, at which point um, you basically have to start again, fully anneal it, reharden it, um, and then heat treat it again. It takes a little practice, but once you get it, then, and that's sort of why I was doing that video before, then you can do stuff like this with a heavier gauge wire. This I'm not strong enough to make a bend like that and make it clean. Um, and um, you know you can even thin the metal down without taking metal away by, by hammering on it, kind of like a blacksmith type of thing. Um, but it allows you to take the heat treatment out so you can machine it with files and things that give you more precision. Or if you have a mill or whatever, you don't want to go in there on, on hardened steel. And then come back and bring the temper back, bring the, the hardness back so that you can use it as a tool. So, very cool. If you have any questions, let me know. Also, that book by um, uh, Tubal Cain um, is uh, highly recommended. Um, and he gives some more sophisticated ways of doing heat treatment if you're making tools, but I don't have any of the fancy uh, kit that he has. So anyhow, um, so the points, heat treating, working with metal, very fun, and I think this end on this thing, which I will attempt once more to get a focused shot of, but you can see the, the chamfer or the the cutout on the side and also on the top. And I suppose if you were right-handed, um, if you were right-handed, you could make sort of the mirror image of this, which I guess would look kind of like that. Um, and you'd still have the same type of thing. If you were a bottom of the keyway tension kind of person, well, I'd have to make this differently. Um, I'd have to do it like this, right? And that actually works as well, for me at least. Right? Wouldn't work for probably for a right-handed person. Um, I guess it, it could, but you probably would prefer to use your index finger, but that's hard because the right hand goes anti-clockwise. Anyway, that's enough of that. Cool idea, give it a go. Um, support your local hobby shops and uh, hardware stores. Um, 
because uh, they often have cool stuff that they just don't carry at Home Depot or Lowe's, and um, you want to keep them in business. So, anyhow, this is Alex. Have fun. Be safe, um, particularly when you're working with hot metal and flying shards of metal. And um, it's always stay legal, um, but have fun. So, cheers. Thanks for watching.